Okay, well, welcome back from the break. Um, we are we are experimenting with a number of innovations here, so hopefully they're 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 all working. So at this time, I'm delighted to introduce Anji Manivanan, who is the director of programs at the World Federalist Movement Institute for Global Policy, which is our main international partner. Anji is a human rights attorney specializing in atrocity prevention. Um, and she primarily oversees the Coalition for the International Criminal Court and the International Coalition for the Responsibility to Protect. Um, another uh, interesting thing about Anji is we both have the same alma mater, both went to NYU. So I was delighted to learn that. So anyhow, uh, Anji will be updating us on the work of the World Federalist Movement and also be taking questions at this time. So take it away, Anji, and you need to unmute yourself. Great, thank you. Um, I think everyone can hear me? Yes? Okay, mm -hmm. great. Uh, sometimes Zoom is a little wonky and I've noticed whenever I have to speak as a panelist, that's when Zoom decides to shut down on me and stop using the sound. Um, thank you for the uh, welcome, Bob. I hope everyone has been enjoying this conference so far. I unfortunately have only, am only able to attend for this short period of time, but I'll see if I'm able to come in on some of the other, other days. As Bob mentioned, I want to give you um, an, an update and share some information about the work that we're doing at World Federalist Movement Institute for Global Policy, which is, I think as many of you know, the Secretariat of uh, the World Federalist Movement. Um, I'm going to try and maybe make my remarks for about half the time and then have more um, space for, for some questions. Um, I think as many of you know, or maybe some of you don't know, uh, WFM IGP uses a coalition operating model. So you may already be somewhat familiar with our longstanding coalition programs, the Coalition for the International Criminal Court, or CICC, and the International Coalition for the Responsibility to Protect, or ICRTP. I'm very excited to announce that WFM IGP is seeking to adopt a broader and a more holistic approach to addressing global challenges by exploring opportunities to, um, to examine, to analyze, and to solve some of the day-to-day -day or so-called ordinary, as we say in the human rights field, human rights violations, women's rights and participation in political processes, systemic racism, and climate change. And we're currently in the process of developing and seeking funding for such projects for the upcoming year. But this year already, as I hope some of you were able to, um, to attend, we launched a virtual conversation series, like many NGOs, I think, that have started doing webinars, especially during um, since the pandemic began. And this virtual conversation series is a platform for solutions-focused discussions by practitioners and experts to explore global challenges against the backdrop of increasing geopolitical instability and hostility to multilateralism. Our programming seeks to strengthen multilateral systems and frameworks from the International Criminal Court to the responsibility to protect the women, peace, and security agenda. And as I mentioned before, we're looking to um, expand into other thematic issues that have a nexus to um, multilateralism and world federalism. I'd like to just give you a bit of background on some of the longstanding programs and some of the pro projects that we have also been implementing that I think are less well known than the CICC and the ICRTP, but just as I'm not sure where everyone's level of knowledge is about the work that we do, I, I hope that's okay. And for those of you who are very familiar with our work, um, apologies for giving you a, a, a bit of a history lesson. Uh, the CICC, which turned 25 years old this year, was established in 1995 as a group of 25 civil society organizations from all over the world. And it successfully pushed for a permanent international criminal court. It's actually widely held and believed that without the CICC, we wouldn't even have an ICC today. The CICC works towards the universality of the Rome Statute system through treaty ratification, a more effective, independent, and fair ICC, improved cooperation between governments, regional organizations, international organizations, and the ICC, and a better understanding of the Rome Statute system. Much of this necessitates strengthening civil society capacities. This year in particular, the CICC has been campaigning to ensure that states nominate and elect only the most highly qualified individuals as ICC officials through fair, transparent, and merit-based processes. Six judges and the, the prosecutor position are open for election this year. So there'll be some interesting things happening, um, happening this December. 
Our other key campaign for some years is the ICRTP, at different levels of the multilateral system since 2009. Responsibility to protect is the doctrine and considered to be an emerging international legal norm by some, including the coalition, and is aimed at preventing and stopping mass atrocity crimes. This doctrine and its three pillars to guide the protection of populations was unanimously endorsed by the world 15 years ago in 2005. The ICRTP increases awareness and endorsements of the responsibility to protect pushes states, regional and sub-regional organizations, and the UN to strengthen their prevention capacities, and develop specific actions to mobilize civil society around at-risk or ongoing situations of mass atrocity crimes. In the COVID age, the ICRTP launched virtual trainings for activists in countries in the Middle East and North Africa, East Africa, and West Africa regions. The MENA tra training um, builds on the ICRTP's previous experience in the region, the East Africa training focuses on election-related violence as a risk factor for mass atrocities or violence. And interestingly enough, there were a lot of, uh, I think, engaging dialogues that have happened with our East Africa partners of this year in particular around issues in the U.S. that I think one wouldn't have expected in previous times. And the West Africa training explores human trafficking as a risk factor for mass atrocities and as an atrocity crime itself. This year has presented opportunities and challenges for both coalitions anti-multilateralism and extremist nationalism and populism are on the rise on a global scale. And the pandemic has caused stakeholders from civil society to states, governmental organizations, to donors to shift their priorities away from these issues and other human rights type issues, public health and humanitarian needs. And this may result in a worrying rollback of the hard won achievements of the past couple of decades. The CICC, for example, continues to operate under extremely challenging circumstances and hostility as demonstrated by withdrawals over the last few years and the more recent threats against the court, namely the US sanctions against the ICC prosecutor. In a nutshell, uh, Trump's executive order allows asset freezes related to the material support of ICC investigations of the US and its allies personnel, potentially implicating civil society like us um, and numerous CICC members that are working in this space. This coupled with the pandemic has already introduced a number of uncertainties uh, around key ICC events like the Assembly of States parties that's happening next month and civil society's ability or inability to participate in them physically or virtually due to various restrictions that now exist uh, related to travel and um, related to protocols by the, by the government of the Netherlands. But fortunately, I think a welcome change in the US government in January may begin a slow process of restoring US cooperation to at least the situation it used to be under President Obama. But in the meantime, and until these changes are effected, uh, I think this is an important issue for all of us because, because this is such a pivotal year at the court. As I mentioned, the prosecutor and six new judges will be elected. And there's also an independent experts review of the ICC that's under consideration. Put differently, the challenge, challenges that face the court also directly impact the campaigns of the CICC and therefore the work that's done by WFMIT. Meanwhile, the responsibility to protect as an idea has suffered, particularly in the aftermath of the international community's response to the situation in Libya in 2011. This is the common topic that comes up every time R2P is raised, no matter who I'm speaking to or where they're located. And this has led to some misunderstandings that the responsibility to protect is synonymous with military intervention and regime change, thus overlooking the range of peaceful measures that actually have to come first. Libya's legacy has therefore been an excuse for third party states to fail in their responsibility to protect populations when the host state is the violator. And even some of the really staunch supporters of the doctrine 15 years ago in 2005 now even shy away from using the phrase responsibility to protect. They might use framing that's related to just civilian protection or atrocity prevention instead. But the ICRTP is planning to help demystify this legacy by producing some more accessible outputs, including um, short animation film in the hopes of revitalizing specific support for the doctrine and answering a lot of the questions that tend to come up in these various forums. Of course, the coalition operating model uh, has limitations in shifting gears or changing direction in the kinds of work and programming that, that we do. 
So WFM has begun expanding its programming beyond the coalition, so beyond the CICC and beyond the ICRTP. For example, this year, WFM IGP began working with civil society organizations in the uh, Global South to amplify their voice and impact regarding the key legal policy and um, practice reforms that they'd like to see in order to uh, further protect and strengthen the ICC's effectiveness, independence, fairness, and integrity as part of the ICC re review process that's ongoing. The findings and recommendations of our Global South partners will actually be released in a report uh, next week. And as a woman and, um, and a gender expert, I don't know if Bob mentioned that in my introduction, I'm also pleased to announce that one of our projects has that engages with the Women, Peace and Security Agenda, which is established by the UN Security Council um, Resolution 1325 20 years ago. This project has been extended for another year. And in this, in this project, we act as part of a really uh, cross-regional and pretty interesting collaboration and exchange between ourselves and partner organizations in parts of the world that you might not expect to come together in Colombia and in Mali. And together, the three organizations, we work together to increase the competence, participation, and influence of women in peace and justice processes, and to strengthen legislative and judicial capacities to enact and implement laws that criminalize conflict-related conflict sexual and gender-based violence and incorporate a gender perspective in peace processes, which are very relevant for those particular in-country situations. I think to reiterate, um, these are again, incredibly difficult times for multilateralism and I think challenging times to also advocate for um, world federalism or world federation or however, whatever branding this particular affiliation is using for this, for this concept. These changing donor priorities, as I sort of touched on, especially due to the coronavirus pandemic have caused many organizations to restructure and results in a lot of staffing changes in organizations. Um, on this point, I'd like to address the, um, I guess somewhat recent departure of our um, previous executive director, Dr. Twanda Hondora, and uh, he left the organization for family reasons that were actually like um, affected by, by the COVID pandemic. Um, but our process to recruit a new executive director is going well. We've received solid applications and our board is in the process of going through them and finalizing a selection. And we're fortunate enough that Keith Best, who I think many of you already know, has been supporting our work as an interim executive director. And we look forward to announcing our uh, new executive director in 2021. So the movement is still, is still going, still going strong despite some of the changes. Um, I hope this has helped to give you a little bit more background about what some of the programmatic and I guess institutional and staffing um, changes and developments in the organization are. So I'll stop there and see and open the floor for, for questions. Great, thank you, Anji. So if you have a question, uh, go to your cyber hand and raise your hand there. Again, if you would go into the chat box, I'm sorry, the participants button, that will open up the list of all the names and you can raise your hand there. I see no hands yet. Well. Um, okay, I see Peter Orvedius. Let's start with you, Peter. Hmm. Let me turn my little thing on. Hi, um, this might be slightly off topic, but um, something I was wondering about about the ICC, um, which I've been covering for my blog uh, to some extent, I noticed that um, the nominations for the prosecutors were reopened, that there were, I believe, four candidates, and then they reopened and extended that. And I haven't found any legal details on why. It seemed rather unusual. And I know there was some uh, uh, critique about that. Can, can you speak to that at all? Like why they reopened the nominations? Was there an issue with those who had been nominated or? Um, yes, there, there was an issue. It was either with the process or with the candidates themselves and how, how it was happening. It, there is actually information here. I don't want to say the wrong thing. I can put it in the chat, um, which is, Maybe, um, as you know, so I'm, I'm, I'm a manager. So in some ways I'm not really working on the nitty gritty of some of these issues. Um, but I, I know that there, there is a reason for that. And there was a lot of debate happening about it, I think um, in the spring and in the summertime. Um, so I can definitely put a resource. I just don't want to spend time trying to remember something and then tell you something that's incorrect. 
Yeah, I'd love to read more about that. Yes. Mostly just a personal curiosity because it seemed rather, rather no strange. Problem. Thank you. Once the Q&A is done, I'll stay on long enough to Great. stick Thank it in the chat and later I can send it to Bob to share with you. Great. Thank you, Angie. We have Ann Zill and then Chuck Woolery in the queue. Uh, if you would unmute yourself when you come on. Thank you. Um, I, uh, dear woman, I would love to have you talk a little more specifically. Uh, and I missed the very beginning, so I may have missed this, about the ways in which we could get the United States um, to sign on to the in International Criminal Court and to um, be a proper participant. Uh, no, I didn't touch on that in my remarks. Um, I think this is a very important um, aspect. Uh, there is ongoing advocacy that members within the CICC do, some of the US based ones. I mean, WFMIGP has a presence in the US, but our headquarters, our main headquarters is in The Hague. Uh, I think that, I think like, I mean, there's probably some need for really creative strategizing. It's unclear what a Biden administration will look like because under Obama, as I mentioned, there was a level of cooperation that exists, but there's been real reluctance to sign on to the court, I think because of political pressures and concerns about uh, US nationals then being prosecuted, which is the reason many um, states are not signing on to the court all over the world, um, and in including in some other some other um, developing world, uh, developed developed world um, countries. So I know that those advocacy campaigns are, are underway. It is possible, though, that this this shift that's happening between a Trump and a Biden era, I think, might present some opportunities on a wide range of issues ranging from, I mean, public health is obviously a big one, um, the economy, but also the ICC. And I think those are things that will be considered and that will be discussed in um, upcoming strategy meetings. The CIC somebody <laughs> should be working on this. This is uh, hugely important. Yes, it is, it is being, it's being worked on, but the challenge of political sure. will is going to be a, is going to be a big hurdle is all I'm saying. Oh, well, I. Thank yes. you, Angie. Before we go over to Chuck, I will just add that um, we are we are we Citizens for Global Solutions is going to mount a new campaign for that. Uh, there are a number of campaigns we'll be starting up with on our website, and that will be one of them. Just to let folks know. Thank you, Chuck. If you would unmute yourself, you're next up. Uh, thanks, Bob. Um, Angie, I, I'm really glad you have a background and foundation of human rights. And uh, ever since the early 80s, I've been attempting to, to, to study studying the links between human rights. And Chuck, if you could lean in towards your microphone so yeah. we can hear you a little better. Thank you. Yeah, I, I'm really glad you have a background in human rights. And uh, since the early 80s, I've been working on uh, the connections between human rights and both human and national security issues. And it, it repeatedly comes up again and again and again. And uh, it looks like the primary bl block to making this world work the way we all want is our our unexamined assumptions about national sovereignty. And that without, with national sovereignty reigning supreme over human rights, we will probably never achieve the goal that we want. And I, and I want you to speak to the, the idea, you mentioned earlier, a holistic approach to the, to the, to the, uh, to the issues that we're, we're facing. And right now it's my understanding that the best holistic approach I've seen is the 17 sustainable development goals. What are, what is, how is that in the context? I know that that this part of the 17 goals is the ICC and the idea of global justice. But what's your perspective on, on that, that, that assertions I just made? Um, on, on the, I, to kind of condense. Human rights being the foundation of human yes. and national security. Um, I mean, I agree that I think national sovereignty to, to many extents is, is causing challenges to the implementation of human rights, particularly in states that are violating them that are uh, entrenched in impunity and that are sort of inaccessible by other kinds of diplomatic means. So I think I, I do agree with you there. Um, this holistic approach that I, I discussed, it does involve engaging with other relevant systems and frameworks such as the SDGs, particularly um, SDG 16 on peace and justice, which I think provides a really good framework for the kinds of issues that, um, that I discussed that are at least being done with a CICC and ICRTP and some of the other, I guess, extraordinary um, human rights violations that occur. Um, so we're beginning to look at that a little bit more. And when I kind of mentioned that we're in the process of developing and pitching some other projects 
aligning them and reframing them in that lens is, is part of it. And reframing things, I think, in a broader, even with broader human rights language, then instead of focusing on, I think, very niche topics of international criminal justice at the ICC, atrocity prevention only in through the responsibility to protect. These are things that we've started to kind of expand on and to look for other linkages in. So hopefully I addressed your question. Well, you mentioned earlier about the shift away from, uh, right. from human rights because of the pandemic. And, and from my perspective, that is the reason we have the pandemic is because we were not focused on human rights, access to healthcare, water, sanitation, basic education, the, the necessities of preventing that kind of stuff. And you mentioned twice the word prevention, but yet I don't hear most of these are things reactionaries, reactions to the problems we face instead of looking at the underlying foundation of real human and, and national security, which from my perspective, I'll say it again, is the protection of human rights, either the Universal Declaration of Human Rights or the 17 Sustainable Development Goals, take your pick. But it, it seems like that's what we're missing as the key target for achieving the world we really want. I'm sorry, I, I don't think I'm sure if there was a question or if that was a, a comment. Hmm. Well, you must have some perspective yeah. on it. Well, I, I'm going to cut in because I do. We, we only have a few minutes left, and I want to see that everybody who has, who has a question gets a chance to ask. So I'm not seeing any in the, in the uh, you know, participants box. So if there's anyone who's having trouble raising their hand, their cyber hand, who wants to say something, you could raise your physical hand, and we'll see that. So I just want to make sure we've gotten everybody. If everyone who, is, who wants to speak has, then I'll go back to letting Chuck continue dialoguing with Anji. But I want to make sure we've got everybody in who wants to. So is there anyone else who hasn't asked a question who, or make a comment who wants to? Going once, going twice, not seeing any. OK, would you clarify, uh, Chuck, if you had a question in what you were saying? Uh, you're muted. Just, just briefly, the question. I think it's just a lost okay, in the longer serious. comment. If we are serious about achieving the world we want to achieve, going down this path within the context of national sovereignty, remaining, letting that remain supreme, seems like a failed, failed mission. That in order to, to really get the world we want, we have to put human rights above state sovereignty, as we did in our own nation over the Civil War. OK, I, I think I see what you're saying. Um, I mean, yes, as our work does center human rights. The problem is from a practical implementation standpoint, the state that you're trying to work with or to target is not looking at things that way. So that just involves some kind of diplomatic finesse that exists. And that's why we also work with state actors. Um, WFMIGP at least does receive money from government donors, which not all human rights NGOs do. But in the spirit of us working towards strengthening some of these systems and trying to overcome some of those hurdles, which exists in some states more than others, that's the approach that we're taking. So, I mean, I agree that human rights should be front and center, but in practice, that simply isn't, it's not a realistic, it's not realistic today. Great, thank you. So I'm not seeing any other hands. So Anji, I will let you know that we still have three more minutes if there's anything else you wanted to add that you didn't have a chance to bring up. Um, I, I don't think so. Um, I, I will say, though, I'm, I suppose this is a comment on my end. I've noticed in the couple of times that I've made these um, remarks, I get a lot of ICC-focused questions and not really the preventative questions, actually. That's interesting and sort of going with, off of what, what Chuck says. I mean, the ICC has the potential of preventing atrocities, but it's really not proven. Um, so instead, I, I just find that in a lot of these forums, the focus ends up being on what is the reaction, what is the response, what is the the justice outcome. Um, and I think that's that's interesting. And in some ways and in some circles, um, and maybe folks who are in the US and following these prison abolition movements and things like that, there is there are even dis debates about what that looks like with the ICC. I'm sorry, but I can't help with that yet. <laughs> think something cut in. Um, that the uh, yes, no, I, I see a comment here. I don't think the ICC deters or prevents um, atrocities. I'll just address this, a private comment that I received um, publicly. And there's a lot of studies that indicate that this is really mixed because if someone's really committed to 
the high level people that are prosecuted at the ICC. They're not the ones who get deterred by criminal justice and they're likely the ones who never get caught um, because they just stay at home or they're in a country that's not part of the system or they are moving around and they're not getting sent to the ICC for various other political, um, political issues. So I suppose I just think that's a sort of interesting thing that I've noticed emerging that these discussions, even though we're trying to shift the focus to prevention, even in forums where it comes up is an important topic, um, the questions and the comments still have a lot to do with that responsive um, mechanism. So it's just an observation. I don't have any other like any other closing remarks, except to say thank you for, for inviting me. And I thought I had left enough time for questions, but it looks like the questions were a little complex and I did not have enough time for it. So many apologies about that. I put my email in the chat though, and um. Bob and Donna and others who organized it can also um, share it with you if you lose it and you can feel free to reach out to me that way. Thank you. Um, we do have to move on. I will say though that at the end, we, we have a number of, of uh, breakout rooms which we'll describe later. Um, however, An Angie won't be able to join us because she's, she's finishing getting a grant out uh, <laughs> yes. that has a, a quick due date. So folks who want to talk about the World Federalist Movement can still congregate there. Again, at the end, we'll talk about this and, and set it up and explain it. We have a number of breakout rooms to continue these discussions, but unfortunately, Anji won't be able to join us in the one about the World Federalist Movement. But I do wanna thank you and let you go back to your, your grant writing and yes, uh, we will move on.